Hello, everyone. Welcome to Democracy Dialogues, where we go beyond the headlines to discuss what's really happening in the Americas. I'm your host, Eric Farnsworth, coming to you from Washington. 2024 is a year of elections, not just in the Americas and the United States, but worldwide. The stresses on democratic governance and new tools available to disrupt it are well known and seemingly proliferating. It's a year that could prove to be a democratic inflection point. Our guest today is someone who knows these issues intimately, Francisco Pacho Santos. A seasoned journalist with his own compelling backstory, Ambassador Santos served as the Vice President of Colombia and later as the Ambassador of Colombia to the United States. His leadership and advocacy on democracy issues extend not only within Colombia, but indeed across the entire region. We're delighted to have him with us for a deep dive on Colombia's ongoing political and security challenges, as well as the increasing influence of extra-regional actors, including China, Russia, and Iran, across the region. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to Democracy Dialogues. It's a pleasure being here, Eric. Thanks. This is the year of the elections around the world, uh, certainly in the Western Hemisphere, including the United States. We've just seen a very difficult transition in Guatemala. We've seen recent elections in Argentina. We have a number of others upcoming. Give us a sense of your overall view of uh, how are, what's the state of democracy in the Western Hemisphere? I think it's in good health, but with very bad symptoms. Look at what happened in Ecuador. Candidate was killed. It changed the result of the election. Then you have that disruption uh, of drug traffickers, which I think is going to become, uh, become more and more generalized. Uh, but you had a, a, a great result in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very clean election in Argentina. Um, now, in this year, Mexico is probably the most important one. And, 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 uh, and hopefully the, the, the populism of, of uh, López Obrador, which has hurt democracy really, really hard, uh, will be uh, left aside. I don't know if. If, if his candidate will be able to do that. So I think it's a good stage, but you have the threats of drug trafficking and criminal gangs. You have the threats of uh, disruption by external actors, uh, China, Russia, Iran. Uh, you have Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua becoming, you know, a, a also elements of disruption from outside, but become the operators. So, so, uh, so we have to keep an eye because... Uh, they don't like uh, democracy, and they're certainly going to disrupt it. What are some of the things that determine if uh, democracy is healthy in the region and, and elections are clean and free and fair? You've given us several examples with varying degrees of uh, optimism and, or not. What are some of the things we should look for to make sure that democracy is healthy? Well, the one thing that, that is very important is that the other guys do such a bad job. <laughs> because when you look at the mirror of, of Venezuela and you look at the mirror of Cuba, you say, oh, my God, I don't want to be there. I don't want to do that. So, so, so that's... That, that's one of the big ifs that, uh, that, that we have <laughs> to maintain. The other is security, security, and security. I think security is becoming a critical issue in all of the countries. You go to Rosario. Rosario is a mess. You go to certain parts of uh, Santiago, and you're having really big problems. Uh, what happens in, what happened in, in, in Ecuador, Brazil, you're seeing an empowerment of the criminal gangs that I think what Bukele did in, uh, in El Salvador is getting even a more stronger view and more stronger approval, which is good on the one hand, but it has a cost in terms of human rights and in terms of due process and in terms of democracy and freedom. But um, people are deciding, hey, I want to live secure. Mm. And I think that's going to become the most critical element in elections uh, probably for the next uh, few years in the region. We're seeing security issues explode across the region. You've mentioned a couple of countries already. You've mentioned Ecuador, El Salvador. There are others uh, as well, no doubt. How does a uh, strange security situation affect democracy? Is it just that voters then want to vote for leaders who are strong in terms of the security issues? Or is there something more insidious in terms of gangs and drug traffickers and others actually infiltrating democratic institutions and processes? How do you see that? It's a mixture of both. Yeah. Look, Pacific Coast in Ecuador is in the hands of drug traffickers. Uh, half of Mexico, or 40% of Mexico, it's in hands of drug traffickers, uh, and they decide who is governor, who is mayor. The infiltration of politics has been uh, 
uh, uh, abrupt, not as abrupt as, uh, but very, very strong. They're now getting into the avocado business. They own uh, critical elements of the avocado business. They own a, a construction businesses, very big concern. And you're starting to see them become an Amazon all over the region, mm -hmm. infiltrating, doing the politics, which they think it, it, it helps them, using the local gangs, and, and, and Ecuador is a great example, empowering them, but never, but always with their DNA of violence. So you see a huge mixture of that from Rio Grande all the way to the Patagonia that is creating very, very big problems for democracy in the region, uh, for security in the region. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge, uh, challenge that, that we have. Uh, the U.S. sort of saw it in Ecuador and signed an agreement with Lasso. And I think the U.S. is going to have to look at this in a very different perspective, mm -hmm. learn from Plan Colombia and say, how can we help really? in the region in this very critical juncture. Let's talk about Colombia, something you know a little bit about. You know, this is a country that has struggled with violence for a long time, of course, <laughs> and uh, President Petro has instituted something that he has called uh, Paz Total. Give us a sense, what is Paz Total and is it working? I thought after Juan Manuel Santos' peace process, we were in peace, mm. which is what he very, very uh, uh, astutely did and sold, and we weren't. That was, that's a failed peace process. Mm. Uh, and it created a huge problem for Colombia. And everything we're seeing now, I think, has a lot to do with uh, Juan Manuel uh, Santos changing the route of where Colombia was going after 2010. Uh, that dramatic increase in, uh, in cultivation from 40,000 to 200,000 in five years, hectares of coca cultivation. The rise of parallel organizations, one of them is called FARC dissidents. They've become the new FARC. At the ELN, which has grown immensely in, uh, in Venezuela, I think it's the first binational guerrilla that we have in the region ever. And I think it's ve that's very important to understand and, and has total support from, uh, from the Venezuelan government. And uh, illegal groups have become a new big challenge for Colombia. And you have a president who's saying, how can I help you? Hmm. And you're starting to see areas of Colombia go back to 2002, where... Those illegal groups control territory, which was part of the huge thing that we did between 2002 and 2010. You're seeing a growth in massacres like never before. Uh, and this is the, the, the government of, of life, and, and, and it has a great discourse, but in reality, it's putting us back 20 years. Paz Total is a speech that doesn't work. Hmm. Paz Total has no, you can't grab it. You don't know what they're doing, uh, what, how this is gonna end. I think it's a discourse in which the guerrillas and the illegal groups are, you know, uh, covering themselves so they have more territorial control and more power. The next government in 2026 is going to have a mess to deal with in terms of security, which is very sad after everything we did very successfully between 2002 and 2010. What are some of those lessons that uh, you wish would continue to be applied uh, from 2006, 2010? What are some of those uh, things that uh, showed success and should be continued onward in Colombia? Look, Plan Colombia was a great success until the President Santos in a negotiation with the FARC said, I'm going in a different way. If he had kept it, we could probably have 10, 15, 20,000 hectares. You would have the illegal groups uh, uh, in a stranglehold. Uh, you could probably negotiate the peace process a lot easier, on the other hand, because they don't get the money from the drugs. Uh, but uh, he went in another direction. I think the first lesson is this is a long-term effort that you have to consolidate mm. in, in the long term. One. Two, you're never going to solve the problem. You're going to reduce it to the minimal expression in which it's not a threat to the state, to democracy. It's still a problem, but it's a security problem. Three, you will always have the bubble effect. The bubble effect of, the, of what we did in between 2002 and 2010, uh, moved most of the drug trafficking to the borders. And then it crept into Ecuador. Uh, when it grew dramatically, it started using the Ecuador, Ecuador as, a, as an exporting place. So that's not third, you have to, you have to have bipartisan support. You have to adjust. And one, the most important thing, you need to have skin in the game. Mm. Plan Colombia was paid 90% by the Colombian, by the Colombian. So it's not that the U.S. is going to come and solve your problems. You need to do the, the work on your own. One of the things you referred to is the first binational guerrilla that goes not just in Colombia, but also in Venezuela and back and forth and uh, is really a unified 
uh, operation. Uh, this isn't just a country-specific issue. It's a regional issue, no? And when you have a country like Venezuela on your border that provides safe haven and enables some of these activities, it makes it that much more difficult to to resolve these issues. Let's talk to let's talk about Venezuela for a second. Uh, President Maduro has uh, suggested that uh, he'll hold elections this year, 2024. Speaking of year of elections, how much credibility do you give to that claim? Zero. Mm. There's not going to be free elections. If Mara Corina is not the candidate, that's not free elections. You've got to start by that. Obviously, in the White House, they, they're going to start looking and things, and they're gonna, they're not, they don't have it that clear. Uh, certainly, they had very clearly in, in, in Guatemala. But you go to Venezuela, and I don't know what happens to their mind, and they see it totally different. They have a totally different feeling of democracy. Uh, I don't think they're going to let Maria Corina run, and that means it's not. Mm. It's not a free election, one. Two, the, the U.S. is having less and less capability of, of influence. I think the Russians, the Iranians, I think China are consolidating that power, and they understand that... Uh, Venezuela is Cuba on steroids as a disruptor in the region. It's not a coincidence that uh, the ELN is by national making lots of money in illegal businesses in Venezuela. A few days ago, Syrian who came from Venezuela, got Colombian papers, was arrested in Argentina because he was going to do terrorist acts against, against the Jewish community mm. in Buenos Aires. Not a coincidence that it's Buenos Aires uh, because uh, Millet is there. So, so, so you're seeing an operator like Venezuela that can do it in, on its own, but has the help of Cuba, has the help of Iran, has the help of, of Russia in, in disrupting uh, elections and in creating this type of havoc. And the U.S., uh, to a certain extent, at the White House, they think, you know, they're angels. No, they're thugs, they're criminals, they hate democracy, and they want to eradicate democracy in the region, and they'll do it any way they can. This is the Venezuelan regime. Of course. What could the international community do if and when Maduro does not hold the elections that he says he's going to if Maria Karina Machado is not allowed to compete, or if some of the other factors aren't in place uh, for you know what people would consider free and fair elections? What should be the response of the international community? The first thing is the U.S. has to stop with that uh, that playing a bad cop, good cop. Oh, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna release Alex Saab, and I'm gonna release the the sons of uh, City of Flores, the world drug traffickers, and I'm gonna open up so you get more money. They have to stop that very, very clearly, and they have to say, you are not getting one cent. Mm. Two, they need to really pump up a uh, Maria Corina and everything that she represents, because I think she's the only one who can really move that country to have a, a Venezuelan spring, like the Arab spring, mm -hmm. where they can come up and, and really make a change. I think that's where the change is going to come, from citizens in the streets. And that's why they're so hard against it, really small protests. But what, they, what I think the U.S. doesn't understand uh, is that the military, which certainly has to take down many of those protests, it's in a worse state or it's in the same state that most of civilians are. So, so they're ready to, uh, to uh, if they see a, a view in the future, a real view in the future, they'll, they, 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 they'll move in the right direction. We're here having a hard-hitting conversation on regional democracy with Francisco Pacho Santos, who has joined us uh, to discuss a variety of topics. Let's turn to one that you've teased a little bit already uh, today, uh, but let's get more explicit about it. The influence of outside actors, China, Russia, Iran in the Western Hemisphere, particularly in the democratic process. What do you see happening on the ground, and why do you consider this to be such a threat? Look, we have to go back to, to early 2000s when they did a huge protest against Pre President Gonzalo Sánchez de Lozada in uh, Bolivia, and they took him out. And, and they created this protest, and they created this, this type of dilemma of, uh, oh, you're not providing your... And, and in the end, a democratic president was taken out. They learned that. And they've improved on that. And the result of that type of operation was the rise of Evo Morales. So they said, huh, we have something that's interesting. They sophisticated and they were able to do it in between 2019 and 2021 in Ecuador, in Chile, in Colombia. And the result of those protests, which had outside influence, which had outside financing, and in Colombia is a, a very clear case, 
uh, of it um, were the election of Boric and Petro. So that's one of the elements with which they can operate and, and they can get a political result. They tried from Bolivia to not uh, uh, to take down the president of, uh, of Peru. Uh, she was, you know, she, she replaced uh, uh, the guy who wanted to become a dictator through democratic means, uh, you know, legal means. And, and when you look at how they were able to stop the country, it was exactly the same modus operandi. We stopped the, the airports, we stopped here. We, uh, they weren't able to do it, but I think we need to understand that that's now a modus operandi by, by those powers that, do, that use disruption and they, and they only want to disrupt democracy. Obviously, they have social networks. They're really good at managing social networks and creating narratives, etc. and they're gonna keep doing it. Now with, with, um, with social networks, and, and the management of, of that narrative, you're also creating, you can see how, uh, how especially the Russians that are very good at, uh, have an influence in the region and, and are able to prop up candidates, take down candidates, create, create that type of scenario that is now uh, very easy to create. With, uh, with, with the networks that, that, with the social media and social networks that we have. Is this just a social media story? I mean, Sancho de Lozada, that uh, episode occurred before Facebook yeah. and Twitter. I mean, what are some of the techniques that you're seeing on the ground that some of these countries are using beyond, uh, you know, well, formerly Twitter, now called X, but other social media, TikTok, et cetera? No, I think that's the biggest problem that we have. Mm. And uh, look, when the Soviet Union fell, the intelligence agencies of the, of, of the Soviet Union and now Russia never took their eye off Latin America. They said Latin America is of strategic interest to us. They kept contact with the uh, uh, illegal groups. They kept contact with uh, uh, guerrilla groups. They get kept in contact with anarchists, uh, with communist party, etc. And they just, you know, in a, in a, in a very low uh, type of, uh, of, of management, kept them alive and they started propping them up. And the first time they propped them up is with Evo Morales. Mm. And that, that's the first time that you see, wow, this is how, they, how they, they took down a government. They learned, they sophisticated. You look at things similar that haven't worked in other countries, but the next time it worked was in Chile. It almost worked with Ecuador, uh, and it worked with Colombia. So, so you're going to see, and I have no doubt, that, uh, you're going to see uh, this type of paralysis of economies by small groups of very violent people uh, creating those conditions that allow some radical elements of, uh, of society getting to power. The problem is uh, now you have an alternative and that alternative is Bukele. Mm. And Bukele has become an alternative in many places of the region. And, and I think Bukele has creating a new way of, or, or a way of seeing things that that people say, okay, I'm willing to sacrifice some of my liberties, some of my freedoms, some of, of uh, the things that democracy gives, if I can live uh, secure. So, so I, I think that's a that's a, a, a road that is going to, only starting to be explored now. You've laid out some of the issues that uh, the region is facing. You know, presumably these aren't secrets anymore. No. We've we've gone through a couple election cycles. We've seen them in operation. We've seen the impact. Are regional democracies now better prepared to address them in the next elections, in the forthcoming elections? Are they receiving the support that they need from the U.S. or from other international actors? Or is this just, uh, you know, good luck, uh, you're on your own type of scenario? How do you, uh, are democracies resilient uh, to these new threats, I guess is what I'm asking. I think democracies are more resilient than what we think. I think we are alone. Uh, we're not prepared for what is coming, to be very, very, very sincere, and we are alone. That's scary. Saying that, I'm still very, I, I think democracy is very resilient uh, in the region, and what the other guys put out was so bad, <laughs> such a bad movie that people say, no, nah, I don't want to go into that. So that's, that's still an impact. And I think what we need to do to a certain extent is still show the crisis of of, uh, of uh, Venezuela and of Cuba, which they don't like to, but we need to do a, a better effort of showing the horrors of uh, how people live in Cuba and how they're starting to live in Nicaragua. So, so it's more and more, uh, a, you know, normal Latin America saying, nah, not that. I'd rather have, I'd rather know the bad guy that I know than that this guy that promised everything and is horrible. 
Mr. Ambassador, I want to thank you for your time. This has been a provocative but fascinating conversation with you, as it always is. I want to thank you for joining us at Democracy Dialogues, and I hope you'll come back. Thank you, Eric. Pleasure being here. And thank you again for joining us here at Democracy Dialogues and for your support throughout the year. Join us each month on the first Thursday on YouTube or on our website, www.as-coa.org. Until then, let's continue working together to ensure that democracy delivers for all of us.